Good evening. This is Dawn with Watchwoman on the Wall. Uh, well, I have a few things to share with you. Um, this might be a bit of a lengthier video, so if you're more into shorts, TikTok videos, that kind of thing, this might not be the video for you. But I want to share a few things with you. First off, I want to cover um, go, going back to the video I did last about not looking back but looking forward. And as it was a pro for the new year, um, I do want to add um, kind of like an addendum to this. So what I don't want to do is come across as someone who um, believes that by my action of, you know, looking at going into a new home, things like that, making plans for the future, um, that I'm saying that I don't believe that Jesus will come back any minute. That is not true. Um, I don't want that to be what the message was about or came across as. Uh, I believe that Jesus can come back at any time, and I've often joked with people that, um, you know, he could come back while I'm pushing my couch down the street since I've only got, you know, a couple of houses, a couple of doors down that I have to move to. Um, I was sharing with my sister, and I'm a better writer than speaker, so I wanted to share this with you, um, that... I used to think this way. This is the way I used to think. I used to get all bent out of shape. The, if someone was planning a seminar a few months out, you'd hear, um, you know, an advertisement for a seminar, Christian seminar. And um, somewhere in the last few years, I would think, how could they be thinking that far out? We won't be here. Or um, if someone was planning a vacation or a wedding or something far out in the next year, I would get bent out of shape because I would think, you know, well, they must not think he's coming back soon. And somehow I equated that with God's timing. And we must be careful to not assume that God's timing is our timing. Uh, he can come back at any time. And, um, you know, he doesn't want us to just stop living, go stand on the roof and stare up at the clouds. Uh, we're to live our life and we're to live it abundantly. And part of living it abundantly is testifying of his love for us to others, um, you know, giving the gospel to others while we're here and truly filling the days with what he wants us to do. And part of that is enjoying the life he's given us to the fullest. And, um, you know, so many self-proclaimed Christians just, they don't, they seem miserable. They're absolutely, um, they look and sound miserable and we're not called to do that. We're called to be lights in this world. He called us to be a light on a hill a city which cannot be hidden. And uh, we are all going through the ringer. We are all going through our share of trouble. And he already told us that in this world we would have trouble. But to be of good courage, for he's overcome the world. Uh, so I don't want that to be what the message was in my last video. I want you to be encouraged that um, for me personally, um, this is a call to action and a call to faith and putting my faith in action. So many years I've been comfortable in one spot and some for some time I was, you know, the Lord had me waiting on him and there's absolutely nothing wrong with waiting on the Lord. He wants us to. But when he says go, we're called to go. And so for me, um, if nothing else, and I've told my own family this, even if we don't get to stay in our new house for very long or, you know, it's a short season or we're in the process of moving and he and, and the rapture happens. That's okay with me. Uh, for me, this was um, a test of my faith in him and uh, li just listening and obedience to him. So this was stretching me. This was stretching my spiritual muscles. So I just want to get that out front of the video um, since that is what we covered last time. And I want you to be encouraged. So I believe that he will come while we are busy. Um, living our lives. Um, that is what the rapture is marked by. In Luke 17, 26, and it, it says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. I don't think this describes the tribulation at all. People will be starving in the tri tribulation. They'll be having trouble finding water in the tribulation, so they won't be drinking water, much less alcohol or anything else that this is... Um, this is implying they married wives, they were given in marriage. Also, I don't think marriage will be a big thing. 
when people are running for their lives. So I think this speaks of a time before the tribulation, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Um, we represent, um, Noah is a very good um, analogy of us as we go into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It also says, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. So honestly, when the wrath of God is pouring down, and there's 100 pound hailstones coming down the last half of the uh, tribulation, all these all hells breaking loose, only it is the wrath of God, but he's allowing these things to happen. There will not be building, they'll be destroying. There will not be selling, I believe, unless it's with the mark. Um, and there will not be planting and building as there is now. So I think this speaks to now, the specific time. So I just thought of that as I'm getting ready to buy, buy a house. Um, and then I also wanted to remind you that in James 4, 13, it says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So as a precautionary reminder, that is the attitude that we have when we make these plans for the future, is does the Lord will it? And as the Lord wills it, he will allow it. If he does will it, it will happen. Um, so to make future plans without um, trusting the Lord or putting our faith in him, the plans are foolish. Um, in fact, he calls them a boast in our arrogance. And all boasting is evil, all such boasting is evil. Our only boast is in him, as Paul reminded us to. So that was the beginning of what I wanted to speak on. The other thing I wanted to share with you was um, a short study in Psalm 107. Now, many of you may say, why didn't you split this video up? Um, I don't know. I felt the Lord calling me to go ahead and share this as well tonight, even though that will make the video a little longer. That's okay. Um, if you're willing to stick with me, I believe you'll be blessed by it. And uh, as I was reading this chapter, um, Psalm 107, the other day, I realized that there were four groups of people that had been redeemed by the Lord. This is the story of all of us and where we come from. So this is kind of a look back from where we might fit into one or more of these categories um, to why we should be thankful to the Lord. So I'm going to read Psalm 107. It is somewhat lengthy, but I want to break it down for you. Um, starting in verse 1, it says, Go give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. This is what he's going to be doing for all of us, gathering us up from the land. When he raptures us up, he will be gathering us. Uh, the first group, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. This first group is the group I call the lost seeker, the redeemed, those who were wandering, looking for something and found deliverance. Maybe you fit into that category. You've called out to the Lord, you were lost for a time, you were thirsty, you recognized your hunger, you recognized your thirst for him, for something, and maybe you didn't know right away for what it was, but he built into you this, it's almost like you're seek, you were designed to seek and you were designed to find. And he is calling out to those who have not found him yet. But that is the first group. Here is the second group. See if you can figure out who they are. It says, those in verse 10 who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons. 
because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. He's calling us back to giving thanks to him. for, And he's, he's saying, oh, that they would do that. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. So he's our jailbreaker. This second group are the bound up, that's what I call them. Those who found themselves in a dark place. Those under bondage of some sort, perhaps addiction. They're bound. Those in rebellion to him. Maybe they heard the words of truth at one point in their lives and they went diametrically opposite direction. Perhaps that's one of you, that's some of you perhaps at one point in your life or even now, finding yourself in a place where you are in prison to whatever rebellion that you set yourself up for in life. Um, if you're in addiction, you know, of course, that that really does bind. It binds your whole life. Um, it governs the decisions that you make and causes you to realize um, pretty soon that you're in a spiral. Uh, but he has come to deliver the captive. He has come to set the captive free and bind up their wounds. He breaks the chains that bind us. Now I'm going to read about the third group in verses 17 through 22. Fools, because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food. Notice it says their soul abhorred all manner of food, not their body, not their flesh, but their soul. And they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. From their destructions, not just from destruction their own device. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. I want to come, and it would, let me finish that. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his work with rejoicing. This third group is what I call the lovers of worldly pleasure, those in habitual sin, rejecting spiritual things. Um, so they long for the temporal pleasures of the, this life, I say that because their soul abhorred all manner of food. Um, this is food for the soul, not food for the body. This is um, food that nourishes and grows you spiritually. They rejected it. They only wanted temporal things, surface level things that gave them joy from a moment, temporal joy that does not last. Now, because of their transgression, their continual sin, because of their iniquities, they were afflicted. So they paid for their iniquities themselves and so they were captive. And they were in a loop as well, just like those who are addicted, those who are in chains. But, but they called out to the Lord and he delivered them as well. I hope you're seeing a theme here. The last group is verse 22 through 32. It says, those who go down to the ship, the sea and ships who do business on great waters. They see the works of the Lord, his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. They melt up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths, so they're on these waves, these big waves. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. This fourth group are those in peril, those in physical danger, and those at the end of their own strength. These people he used as a great illustration, a, um, a seaman on the ship, in the ship, and how they could see the power of God and marvel at it, but at the same time understand that it could also bring danger to them. And they could revere 
the God who made the seas, and they could also fear him at the same time. But again, they were at their wit's end, and they cried out to the Lord, and he saved them. I was reading a commentary on this, and I thought it was very interesting how, um, I think it was Luke, I'm not sure, in one of the Gospels where Jesus actually did calm the sea, and the waves calmed down, and they called out to him in their distress, and it was a beautiful parallel of Psalm 107. And the writer in, in uh, Luke, how that writer must have tied it to um, Psalm 107, knowing, knowing the Old Testament, knowing the history of the Psalms, as well-versed as they were, and how we, when we read the Psalms, tie it to Jesus, knew the, to the New Testament. We look forward, they looked back. Um, they had something to look back towards, and we have something to look, f we have the New Testament to look forward to from the Old Testament. So um, if you're only reading one testament, you're missing out. You need to read both. So I thought that was very, very cool, actually, how the Lord paralleled and in his miracle uh, of calming the seas, he paralleled Psalm 107. Now I want to touch on the very last few verses of this chapter because this shows the justice of God and how it is made manifest to the righteous and the unrighteous whether here on earth now or in the millennial kingdom. So keep that in mind as I read this. He turns rivers into wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, uh, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Now for the righteous, he turns a wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. There he makes the hungry dwell that they may establish a city for a dwelling place and sow fields and plant vineyards that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them, and they multiply greatly, and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet he sets the poor on high, I love this, far from affliction, and makes their families like a flock. The righteous see it and rejoice, and all iniquity stops its mouth. There will come a time that iniquity stops its mouth. Whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. So this chapter is just a study on the loving kindness of God, and it's a cry to everyone to acknowledge where you came from and to thank him, to declare his works with rejoicing, and to exalt him among those. So I don't know which group you fall into or if um, you fall into more than one group um, as far as where you came from. Um, honestly, as I've said in the past, I think we've all wandered a little bit. Um, I grew up in the church, but that doesn't mean that I didn't wander. Um, I had a time of wandering away. Um, I didn't walk away from the Lord altogether. But because of the type of things I was doing, I was not proud of myself, and therefore I didn't run to him. Instead, it made me ashamed, like Adam with his fig leaf in the garden. Um, and when he came in the cool of the morning to look for me, you know, I was hiding with the fig leaf in front of me and in all the right places. So it's not like he didn't see. <laughs> it's not like he didn't see us for what we were or who we are or what we were doing. But... I thank God for the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus Christ. I thank him for the blood sacrifice that Jesus made to cover me, to atone for my sin. He is my covering. He is my righteousness. Um, all that we do on our own is like filthy rags. But you know what? Um, when we do what the Holy, when the Holy Spirit in us does a work, it is righteous. It is righteous. He loves the righteous works of the saints. Um, you know, there is nothing wrong with holy living. We're called to holy living. But understand that Jesus is our righteousness. And um, he is the only way that we are saved. Just by believing, on, by believing on his death and resurrection. Believing his blood atones for us. So um, I know this was lengthy and it may not have been as in-depth as I would have liked. But I thought that was interesting that there were four different groups that he spoke to me about and separating them the way that he did. Uh, again, um, time is short. And 
the point of this video is to, sh to kind of bring us back to where we came from to celebrate what he has done for us. Um, I wanted to do something a little different tonight because we're used to looking at the news around us and there are those well equipped to do it. I'm not. Uh, we're used to looking at those things and our hearts kind of do a flip-flop or we just get frustrated that we're still here. Don't mind the grandfather clock. But what always draws us into fellowship and deeper fellowship with Christ and with the Father is being thankful to Him and being grateful to Him and worshiping Him, giving Him, ascribing Him the worth that is due Him. So that's what I wanted to do tonight. In a roundabout way, we did worship Him. We looked at ways in which we have um, been rescued. We have been delivered by Him. And um, this is just a tribute to what he has done and taken us through and how he's going to deliver us. So I love you all. I really do. And if you need prayer, let me know. You know I'm here. I've always been here to pray for you guys. Um, I enjoy catching up with all of you. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful night. And please do in the comments section if you um, can kind of look at your past and relate to one of those four groups. Put that in the comment section if you... Um, have a mind to do so and kind of give us a testimony of where you've come from and what the Lord has done for you. All right. Well, I love you guys and I hope you have a wonderful night. Maranatha.